All right. Um, okay, so I hope this is working. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to do a medication quiz three review. Today, I'm going to record this so that I can post it for you guys early tomorrow. So medication quiz three is one of the longest quiz or the hardest quiz, I would say. Um, however, if you guys know the medication, um, know the adverse effect and also the nursing consideration of that medication and, and definitely know the what is it used for and what must we assess for before we give the medication, then you guys will be okay on the quiz. Um, so without further ado, uh, well, I hope that you guys don't mind that this is a recording session and I hope it will be helpful. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, we're going to go straight in uh, to keep it short, simple, and sweet. Okay, so medication quiz number three. So let's go over cardiac med first. Uh, digoxin is one of the most popular medication that will be given for patients with cardiac problems. And um, you guys will see this medication over and over and over again. And you guys will see it when taking NCLEX, HESI exit everywhere, okay? So it's important to know this medication by heart from now. So digoxin, it is used to treat heart failure and dysrhythmia. Remember heart failure, the heart is weakened. It does not pump effectively. So therefore the digoxin, when it gives to the patient, it slow the heart down and it make the heart contract more effectively. So therefore they have time to refill uh, the, um, the chambers and also they have the strength to contract to push out uh, adequate cardiac output. Okay, so again, digoxin enhance the contractility issues of the heart, used for AFib uh, usually, and it slow the heart down, makes it pumps more effectively. So side effect, side effect, not adverse. Side effect is different from adverse effect, okay? So adverse effects are like toxicity or things that could be lethal to the patients, where side effect is side effects uh, like fatigue, anorexia, bradycardia. So we do not give this medication in the morning. We give this around afternoon time, about 1 p.m. Uh, because the heart rate is more stable in this time. The reason why we don't give in the morning is usually because when we wake up after sleep, our heart rate usually very low and we don't wanna give digoxin to lower, even lower the heart rate, okay? So what to do? So we have to continuously monitor digoxin because this drug have a very ther low, th low therapeutic range. Uh, it's only from 0 0.5 to two, okay? And if it's more than two, it's considered toxicity. So we have to hold the medication and call the doctor. So that's why we have to, when as the nurse, we give this medications, we have to continuously draw the blood from the patient and uh, to, to, to measure the, 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 the level of the digoxin in the blood, okay? Um, yes, so if the medication is less than 0 0.5, meaning the, the, the range, the, the therapeutic, the level of the drug in the blood is less than 0 0.5, we continue giving the drug to increase the current level and expect doctor to increase the dose for this patient simply because it's not in the therapeutic range. The therapeutic range is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1.6, I think. Um, I'll make sure uh, to do that. Let me hold this real quick, pause. All right, back on recording. Yeah, so I just make sure, look at my note. So digoxin level is, um, the therapeutic range is between 0 0.5 to two, okay? so please remember that drill in your head. If it's more than two, it's considered toxicity and we have to call the doctor. Um, also, we have to monitor the potassium level because hypokalemia, meaning not, not enough 
potassium in the blood can increase its risk for digoxin toxicity. Um, and we also need to monitor the pulse for the patient. If the pulse is less than 60 beats per minute, we also hold the medication and call the doctor, okay? But hold the medication is the first thing that you guys need to choose or do. Um, and because hypokalemia can increase the risk for toxicity in digoxin, we have to be concern if the patient is taking furosemilasic because furosemilasic is a potassium wasting diuretic that can lower the potassium level in the blood. So we have to make that connection and then um, make sure that we monitor the potassium very carefully when the patient on both digoxin and furosemide, okay? So we talk about digoxin toxicity, what are the signs? The signs symptom of digoxin toxicity include vertigo, yellow green halo visions, nausea and vomiting, mental status changes. So that's the underlie is the is what you guys should definitely need to remember. Mental status changes, the patient LOC will change. They'll be more confused and not alert and oriented anymore. They started having episode of nausea and vomiting. And, uh, and so they have a yellow and green halo visions. Tachycardia, hurt blocks. If the patient take diuretic, especially LASIK, potassium wasting, it increases the risk for digoxin toxicity due to potential hypokalemia. All right, let's move on. Now we have adrenergic blocker. This is also known as alpha blocker, um, used for that usually used for tamsulosin. Uh, tamsulosin uh, is the medication where uh, used for patient with uh, benign hyperplasia prostate. Uh, so these the tamsulosin will vasodilate the um, the constriction of the 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 the, the prostate gland uh, and uh, promote a peeing for those patients. Um, it also used to lower the blood pressure by because it is an antihypertensive medication, and it can be used for management of opioid withdrawals. A common drug in this class is clonidine, uh, catapress. Uh, this meant specifically lower the blood pressure, okay? So side, side effect is, the biggest side effect of alpha blocker is palpitation. The patient feel like there are butterflies in the chest. So that if there's a question in the exam that's mentioning about patient uh, verbalization of feeling butterfly flying in the chest, that's alpha blockers. They will have bad dry mouth and they have orthostatic hypertension, so very common. So to be honest, guy, all of the blood pressure medication will lead to orthostatic hypertension. That's because they lower the blood pressure. So all of these patients are at risk for hypotensive um, orthostatic hypertension. Okay, and um, bradycardia dizziness. What do we need to teach? So we need to teach these patients to get up slowly. Uh, because orthostatic hypertension, uh, we tell them to suck on the heart candy uh, for dry mouth and teach them to monitor pulse and blood pressure. What to do? Must take blood pressure before giving med. If blood pressure is more than 100, then we hold the medication. I mean, less than 100, then we hold the medication, okay? So it should be like this, less than 100, and we hold the medication why? Because this medication lower the blood pressure. If the blood pressure, specifically the systolic blood pressure is already less than 100, then we hold the medication. All right, beta blocker. Beta blocker is another very common drug that you guys need to know. Uh, beta blocker is, uh, is uh, usually used to treat hypertension, cardiac dysrhythmia, MI, uh, and metoprolol is one of the most common drugs. Uh, also, beta blocker is always an in LL, uh, so that's a, a good way to remember it. Uh, it used to treat angina, especially exercising angina, and it lowered the blood pressure and lowered the pulse. So because it's lowered the blood pressure and lowered the pulse, so it will make sense if we mm, have to monitor the blood pressure and pulse before we administer these medications, okay? So we hold the medication if the heart rate is less than 60. We hold the med if the heart rate is less than 50 and blood pressure less than 100, okay? Um, withdraw gradually. We don't, we taper off this medication. We don't just discontinue it 
um, immediately. Uh, we have to also monitor for blood sugar, cholesterol, and triglycerides, specifically blood sugar because beta blocker can uh, increase uh, the sugar level in the blood. So we have to monitor for that. Um, also, side effect of beta blocker is bradycardia, hypotension, and it can cause water retention, lead to weight gain. And also, the increase in glucose level can lead to weight gain as well. So, beta blocker can cause CHA, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, swelling in the heart to fluid retention, altered glucose and lipid metabolism as well. The biggest contraindication in beta blocker for the first time taker uh, for, is the risk for bronchospasm. If the patient, when they take this med and they feel shortness of breath, chest tightness and wheezing, what do we do? We call 911 immediately uh, and uh, contraindicated uh, in patients who uh, have glaucoma. Next, we have CCP, calcium channel blocker. Uh, so one of the most common CCP is um, low the pain, usually the CCP calcium channel blocker and in the pain. Okay. It helps with afterload issues. What is afterload, guys? Tell me. All right. So afterload is the, uh, I forget. No, I remember now. <laughs> so afterload is the resistance that the herd has to pump against in order to get the cardiac output out to the rest of the body. All right. So that's the afterload. Preload is the amount of the volume of the fluid and blood go from the vena cava to the uh, right atrium and right, right ventricle. Okay, afterload is the um, the 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 resistance that the heart has to pump against. All right, uh, calcium channel blocker. It used to vasodilate, meaning dilate the the vessels and to treat, treat hypertension, angina, meaning chest pain. Uh, calcium channel blocker often not specifically used for hypertension patient, but it used to control angina and chest pain. So that's a thing to remember too. Patient with chronic angina, we use CCB. Side effect include bradycardia, orthostatic hypertensions, low heart rate, swelling, peripheral edema, dizzy. Consideration include do not give you grapefruit juice because it can decrease metabolism. Okay, here's the tips, guys. Whenever you guys are doing tests or anything, um, if there's grapefruit juice and um, yeah, don't pick it. Or if they ask which uh, is a concern, then pick grapefruit juice because it's always um, uh, decreases metabolism of the medication. So we do not give the medication with grapefruit juice whatsoever, okay? All right, next we have ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors is also really common. It's come up all the time in HESI, EXIT, or um, in upper courses, MESER 2 for sure. So uses of ACE inhibitor is definitely for hypertension and heart failure. Uh, ACE inhibitor and Impril, P-R-I-L. It works in the kidney. So remember that it works in the kidney. It prevents the conversion of the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which will then reduce the vasoconstriction and reduce sodium and water retention. Therefore, it leads to a decrease in blood pressure and decrease in heart rate. The biggest side effect is dry cough. That's important to remember. Dry cough, non-productive cough, is, the, is one of the biggest side effects of ACE inhibitors. Um, decreased renal function, hypotension, chest pain, hyperkalemia, and hypermagnesia. Okay, so we do not use with potassium sparing diuretic ACE inhibitor, and we do not use with NSAID and aspirin. Why? It's good to, to know, memorize, but we also want to know why. So the reason why we don't want to use ACE inhibitor with potassium sparing diuretic is because potassium sparing diuretic will increase the potassium level in the body and high level of potassium will increase the workload of the kidney and therefore can lead to, and 
therefore can also lead to overwork the kidney. ACE inhibitors already decrease the renal function. If we give them with a medication that retain potassium and both of these medication overwork the kidney, it can lead the patient to acute kidney injury and maybe lead overall over time leading to chronic kidney injury. So we don't want that. So that's why we do not give with potassium sparing diuretics. Next, NSAID and aspirin. Aspirin is NSAID. NSAID and aspirin have a tendency to cause kidney toxicity. So obviously we don't want to give it with medication that can cause decrease in renal function, right? Okay, next what to do. We need to monitor potassium level and we need to monitor magnesium level when patients are on ACE inhibitor. Monitor for kidney function, including BUN, creatinine, sodium, EGFR, and potassium. Angiotensin II receptor blocker. Why we, okay, why do we monitor potassium for a kidney patient? The reason is because the kidney is supposed to filter out potassium. If the potassium is elevated, that means that the kidney does not function very well. So that's why we need to monitor potassium level. Angiotensin II receptor blockers. Um, the use is, it, it, okay, it used to also treat hypertension. It's adjunct therapy for heart failure. One of the most common med is lorzatin. It's always N in certain. This age, Angiotensin II receptor blockers. I call it ARPS. Um, side effect, potent vasodilators, uh, upper respiratory infections, decreased renal function. What to do? We monitor for kidney function, BUN, and sodium, EGFR, and potassium, same. First time giving this drug, watch out for angioedema. Angioedema is edema in the feet, I think. I forget, let me search that real quick. Angioedema. Yeah, angioedema is like overall um, swellingness of the body. Vasodilator. Okay, so we have different vasodilator medication. Vasodilator is obviously used to dilate the, va the vascular system in order to reduce the blood pressure. So we have hydralazine. I usually go to clinical and I see people, the doctor give hydralazine a lot, PRN as needed for patient. So like the patient will be on like an ACE inhibitor as their main medication. But if that does not work, they will have something called PRN as needed medication and hydralazine is usually one of them. Uh, so, so yeah, nitroprusside is also the medication that we give to decreases the blood pressure. However, we must take the blood pressure before we give. Monitor for INO, intake and output, monitor for blood glucose, because the side effect of the vasodilator class medication is hypotension, obviously, hyperglycemia, um, heart attack. Oh no, I mean, this is headache. Headache, not heart attack. Headache, HA is headache. Increase heart rate, consideration, uh, the uh, nipri, which is the nitroprusside, indicated for emergency management of hypertension only. Titrate IV infusion, monitor vital side frequently with continuous cardiac monitoring. All right, now this next is diuretic class. Um, for this class, I really recommend you know only two, furosemide and spinal, spironolactone, because I've never seen the others come up. Um, Diuretic in overall, it works by pulling off the fluid, decreases the volume inside the body and lower the pressure. Keep the patient from fluid overload uh, and lungs fill up with fluid, often due to heart failure. Hypokalemia sign uh, is uh, important to notice in this uh, class because uh, diuretic is um, the two most important class is sparing, uh, potassium sparing and potassium wasting. So monitoring potassium level is key in diuretic. And the normal level of diuretic is 3.5 to 5. Um, hypokalemia side include nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and muscle cramps. So if patient on furosemide and the patient complaining of these, then we need to really look at their lab, right? Potassium. All right, so 
the first is loop diuretic, aka wasting potassium wasting, aka furosemide, aka Lasix. Treatment treat edema associated with heart failure, renal, and hepatic disease. All right. Treatment hypertension treat hypercalcemia because it increases the renal excretion of the calcium. It make we, the, re, the, the kidney pro produce more urine. And whenever there's urine, it's pull all the, the waste in the body and excrete it out. So side effects and what to do. Side effect of loop diuretic is obviously dehydration because they're peeing out a lot of fluid. Hypotension, hypokalemia, hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, Cause and it can also cause ear to plug up, transition deafness, okay? Or tingling in the ear. So remember that. That's a key important thing to remember. Uh, what do we do when we give this med? We monitor for potassium before we're giving it. Uh, if less than 3.5 or too low, we then need to hold the medication. Monitor digoxin level if taken together. Uh, monitor digoxin level if taken together. Remember why? Because hypokalemia can lead to digoxin toxicity. Uh, monitor for intake and output. Monitor for weight. Take the take in the morning. You know why? Okay. So this medication, furosemide, will going to make the patient pee excessively. So we want to give it in the morning so that they can pee when they're awake. If we give it before bed, then they have to really wake up in the middle of the night and go pee. And we don't want that. We don't want to interrupt the sleep cycle of the patient, okay? So this seems like a very easy thing, but remember that you guys can do great on the test. Uh, obviously, take the blood pressure, teach about orthostatic hypertension. LASIK may be given with a low renal perfusion. Asthmatic, don't worry. Next, we have potassium sparing diuretic. The medication is spironolactone. Remember, please. Treat hypertension, same. To reverse, so we give this medication to reverse the potassium loss associated with diuretic induced hypokalemia. Side effects include hyperkalemia, GI complaints, dizziness. Do make sure potassium is not too high when giving these medications. Avoid potassium supplements and food high in potassium like bananas, orange, collard green, kale, potas potatoes, apricots, avocado. Because we already retain a lot of potassium, we don't want to eat more food that high in potassium that can um, increase the level of potassium and then uh, jack up our kidney and also avoid salt substitutes. That's really important to remember. Salt substitute is real high in potassium. Thiazide, don't really need to learn, but yeah, this here for you, okay? Well, let's just go over it. Thiazide diuretic, um, most common medication is hydrochlorothiazide. Treat hypertension, diabetes, insipidus, uh, to reverse potassium loss associated with diuretic induced hypokalemia. Okay, so side effects include hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, headache, and dehydration. Should only be given with adequate renal perfusions. Um, SCTZ is contraindicated with no sensitivity to sulfonamide or thiazide. Also require monitoring of potassium level due to hypokalemia. I also don't think you guys need to know that, that medication specifically. All right, next we have lipid lowering therapy. Use drug if diet and exercise is ineffective. Typically, all lipid lowering drug will cause problem with the liver. Need to evaluate liver function. Okay, I repeat that one more time. Typically, lipid lowering drugs which is the drug in this class, usually they end in statins, uh, will cause problem with the liver. So we need to evaluate the liver function test regularly. And we need to look at their specific liver test, which is the AST and the ALT. So first met statins help break up the fat in the body, inhibit cholesterol synthesis, 
decrease LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and increase HDL, which is the good cholesterol. It has to start with the diet first. If it doesn't work, we will use that and side effect and what to do. Big thing about fat lowering therapy is that it can damage the liver. Must do liver evaluation every six months. Um, do given the in the afternoon, 1 p.m., monitor for liver damage. Niacin, the use of niacin is to lower LDL and triglyceride and increase HDL. What to do, side effect and what to do. Niacin can cause flushing, pruritus, which is itchy, GI side effects and orthostatic hypertension. All right, next we have antiplatelet therapy for coronary artery disease. So antiplatelet, anti also known as anticoagulant. So this medication can increase the patient risk for bleeding, right? So first medication, aspirin. Aspirin is an NSAID. It's a very common drug. We all know that. However, we need to know that um, aspirin can cause a lot of allergic reactions sometimes, and it can cause GI bleeding. So we need to start with a low dose of aspirin first, 81 milligram. Um, how do we know if a patient have a GI bleed? Blood in the stool, abdominal pain, indigestion, heartburn, take a fecal or cold blood test, uh, H&A tell if the patient is losing blood, breathing also be altered, lower hemoglobin, have sign symptom of anemia, lower blood pressure, hypos, high respiratory rate, which is the classic side of hypovolemia, and also, how do we fix it? We give fluid if the patient have inside symptom of hypovolemic shock, fluid fast, fluid first. And what fluid do we give? Normal saline, lactatic ringer. These are iso, no, isotonic uh, fluid. Uh, Plavix. Plavix is another medication that in an antiplatelet class. Plavix only for the patient who cannot take or tolerate aspirin it can have increases the patient risk for bleeding. All right, next, orthomic medication, medication for the eyes. So how do we administer orthomic medication? It's good to know because it will be on the test. Maybe it's not on this test, but it will be on the HESI exit or the HESI measure too, okay? So if both eye drops and eye ointment are scheduled, administer the drop first, the ointment later. Okay, drop first, ointment later. Separate installation by three to five minutes if two medications are scheduled. Place the medication in the lower conjunctival sac. Apply gentle pressure to the nasolacrimal duct for 30 seconds to one minute following administration of the drop. If possible, administer ointment at the bedtime so that the patient close the eye and they don't get irritated after the application of the ointment. Glaucoma medication, again, glaucoma is a patient with a glaucoma a risk for increased intraorbital intra pressures. So um, they will need to take the medication for the rest of their life and go to the doctor every year to do eye exam. Um, increase, so we increase drainage by the opening dutch, uh, decrease production of the aqueous humor and reduce intraocular pressure. These are the goals of uh, glaucoma medication. So cholinergic, which is the meiotic medication, the common medication of the NIT class. Okay, so let's talk about cholinergic. So we know that anti-cholinergic is anti-segregation, right? Anti-cholinergic patient can't see, can spit, can pee, can shit, and um, yeah, something like that. And uh, so cholinergic, is opposite with that. It promotes secretion, right? So it used to decrease intraocular pressure and decreases the aqueous humor production. Side effect include local and limit to the eye, include blurred vision, myopia, nearsightedness, and irritation and pain and spasm. Beta blocker can also be used to treat the glaucoma because um, especially the most common one is timolol, often use of blood pressure. It slow the blood pressure and slow the pulse. The use is this lower the blood pressure on smooth muscle beta cells, 
uh, which reduce the intraocular pressure in the eyes and may be used in combination with myotic for glaucoma. What to do? Must accept blood pressure and pulse prior or after, all right? We just talked about that. Hold the med if heart rate less than 50 and blood pressure less than 100. If the patient develops shortness of breath, contact doctor because that a medical emergency because that is not good. Teach the patient to change position slowly because of the orthostatic hypertension. Usually side effects include eye discomfort and transition burning, blur vision, photophobia, dry eyes, and conjunctivitis, ocular irritation, bradycardia, hypertension, bronchospasm, contraindicated in um, uh, contraindicated patient with asthma and COPD. All right, next we have carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. This reduce aqueous humor production, reduce pressure in the eyes, can exert the same adverse effect associated with the sulfonyl antibiotic. Side effect, blur vision, ocular stinging, tearing photophobia, conjunctivitis, dry, dry eyelid, eyelid, parathesia, polyuria, yeah. Okay, I've n I don't think you're gonna ask this, so don't worry too much about it, but it's always good to know. Next, we have cataract medication. So um, cataract medication is used for pre-op and post-op. Uh, pre-op, uh, we need to use dilating drop to allow the eye to open and see the lens as much as possible so the doctor will have more surface area to work on, right? Topical antibiotic anxiety medication. So the first one we have is cycloplegic and anticholinergic atropine. Dilate the pupil and relax the muscle, contraindicating glaucoma, okay? Tachycardia, uh, elevated blood pressure, conjunctivitis, and photophobia. Atropine toxicity include dry mouth, blur vision, tachycardia, urine retention. Teach patient burning sensation may occur during installation. Post-op, we give them corticosteroid drops to help decrease inflammation uh, and antibiotic drop to decrease post-op infections. Makes sense, right? Next, we have degenerative disease. So uh, multiple sclerosis, there's no cure for MS, but usually we give them steroid immunosuppression, immunomodulators. These medications will help the patient uh, inflammatory uh, or immune system to be depressed so that they don't attack the myelin sheet and causes issues. So yeah. And steroid, you guys have to know that steroid is very bad and it can cause increase in blood sugar, weaken the bone and uh, depress the immune system. So those are things to know about steroid uh, and it's not used for long term. Parkinson medication, it restored the balance of the acetylcholine and dopamine in the central nervous system. So dopaminergic medication include levodopa. This will be on the exam, I'm so sure. Levodopa helps with the lack of dopamine that the patient has. Levodopa is a really common medication that I've seen so many times. Levodopa taken with uh, MAOI inhibitors can cause hypertensive crisis. You guys will come over MAOI inhibitors um, in the future when you guys take psych. Um, but just know that if taken with levodopa, it can cause hypertensive crisis. And MAOI inhibitor is a um, antidepressant medication. So side effect, uh, Parkinson include dyskinesia, inflammatory body movement, chest pain, nausea and vomiting, urinary retention, and constipation. Side effect of um, levodopa overdose is eye twitching, muscle twitching. What do we do? We give the medication with food and avoid excessive vitamin B6 intake. We, okay, this is key to know. Levodopa, we all have to stick the patient on low protein diet because high protein diet will reduce absorption of levodopa. Please remember that. Next, we have myothesia gravis, treat MG with anticholinesterate drugs, okay? Biggest one we use is mestinone. It enhances the function of the muscle. When taking mestinone, we alternate every other day with steroid to decrease the immune system. 
All right, biggest side effect of mestinone is abdominal cramping and contraindicated with client in glaucoma. So you guys see any anticholinergic drug is contraindicated with glaucoma. So atropine and mestinone is not given for someone who have glaucoma. What do we give when someone have glaucoma? The pilo medication, okay? Pilo, 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 remember that, okay? Piloca. That's the medication to remember. All right, next we test that diagnose. How do we diagnose the uh, my, myesthesia gravis? So we do something called enterophonium test, maybe known as the tensilon test. Diagnosis of MG shows significant improvement in muscle tone 30 to 60 seconds after the injection of the Enlon. Muscle improvement lasts four to five minutes. In chronic cholinergic crisis, muscle tone does not improve after injection of the, the Enlon. So Tensilon test to, is a confirmed and diagnostic test of the MG. Entrophonium injection to determine if the patient having an MJ exacerbation or cholinergic crisis. If the symptom improve, we know it's MG. If symptom get worse, it's cholinergic crisis. And the antidote is atropine. Why? Because atropine is a anti-cholinergic. Complication of tensilon test. During tensilon test, we stimulate the muscle. So watch out for irregular heartbeat. Why? Because a heart is a muscle, tachycardia, and a fit. So menstinon is usually given 30 minutes before meal. Next, we have GBS, ground to brain paralysis. This medication, uh, how do, what do we do? We give this patient immunoglobulins, which are pre-made antibody, and they will improve the immune system response to fight cause of this. Um, IV, um, uh, backup protein, and plasma uh, pharesis, which is the fresh frozen plasma. All right, lastly, stroke medication. Well, not yet. We have GI medication too, but let's, but um, yeah. Stroke medication is so important to remember, okay? TIA medication will be on the exam. I'm like so sure, but it's also good to know because neuro is, stroke is something that's so common in life. So TIA medication is anticoagulant medication. It used to treat AFib, control diabetes, control fat, statin, breakdown fat. Priority medication for TIA is blood pressure medication, anticoagulant, and statins. Most priority is anticoagulant, blood thinner. Without it, there's no perfusion because the artery is clot. If we do not treat, potential complication stroke can occur. Ischemic stroke medication. Okay, so we have TPA out the face. If patient has an ischemic stroke, we will evaluate to give TPA. Anticoagulant, TPA is an anticoagulant. It is the only one that actually break down the clot. It's, it's in the class called thrombolytic. So we must make assessment before administering this drug. We, we need to have inclusion criteria. Ischemic stroke onset within three hours. If it's outside of three hours, we do not give TPA. CT confirm ischemic stroke. We have to have a CT scan that confirm this is an ischemic stroke because if, 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 if this is a hemorrhagic stroke, we can't give them anticoagulant. It will cause the bleed to bleed out even more. So we have to confirm this is an ischemic stroke. Measurable deficit on the NIH stroke scale examination over 18 years old. And if it met all of these, give the drugs. Exclusion criteria include if symptom are minor, rapidly improving will not work. So if the symptom are just minor and it's improving, we do not give the medication because it will not work. If the patient have a seizure at the onset of stroke, we do not give this medication. Patient's systolic blood pressure over 185, we do not give them this medication because too high. It can increase risk for hemorrhagic bleed. Patient die a lot, diastolic, which is a lower number. Blood pressure is over 110. The same thing it can increase risk for hemorrhagic bleed. Labs, when do we not give it for the patient? If the patient received heparin within the last 48 hours and has elevated PP, PTT, so because the blood too thin to take the drug, so we do not give it. Platelet time is more than 15 seconds. Platelet 
is less than 100,000, glucose is less than 50 or more than 400, or patient has another stroke within the past three months or major surgery within 14 days, we do not give the drug. Okay, so besides TBA, we can also give heparin, coumadin, plavic, aspirin. These are all anticoagulants within the blood. However, this drug cannot be given to hemorrhagic patient because it can kill them. Dilantin, LASIK, mannitor are all diuretic medication to decrease the fluid volume in the brain. This can increase the perfusion as well. Decacron decreases intracranial swelling and it's just steroid, it decreases inflammation. All right, so NR and INR therapeutic range for is between two and three. Therapeutic range for heparin between 50 and 80. I don't think you need to know that, not yet. All right, so now let's move on. So that's the end of the neuro chapter. Okay, now let's move on to the, um, the, the next GI. Let me stop sharing. Let me share again, GI. Okay, perfect. So now we're going to review GI medication. Um, so I will recommend you guys come and watch the uh, tutor first before you guys watch this part of the videos, okay? So go watch the TI chapter tutor today and then go back here and then review the medication. It will be more helpful that way. So goat lightly is a very potent, goat lightly is a potent laxative used to clear the bowels prior to undergoing endoscopy. So it makes the bowel go. However, it also provides electrolytes. So it makes the, the patient literally like poop a lot. The thickened liquid, it is a thickened liquid prescribed as a gallon. The patient has to start drinking the night before and drink as much as they tolerate it. It is, how do we um, evaluate effectiveness? Everything come out of the patient will be clear. No stool or chunks. If not effective, we do enemas until clear. Side effect, hypotension and dehydration, obviously because these patients pooped a lot, diarrhea. Uh, the, the reason is for the endoscopy, they need a clean intestine so that it can look at everything. Class, so the first class will have a H2 blocker. Example are cimetidine, tacamet, or famotidine, pepsid. This heal ulcer and prevents stress ulcer, okay? It prevents and heal stress ulcer, famotidine, pepsid, super common in the hospital, shoreline, you guys see it all the time. Mechanism of action, it's the CREED hydrochloric acid that produced by the stomach. It reduces symptom and promote esophageal healing in 50% of the patients. Side effects are uncommon. Most common side effect is confusion. Used for seasonal patient and GERD. All right, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. So omeprazole, paralosic, or pantoprazole protonics, so prazole, PPI. It inhibits the acid from being produced. It decreases the incidence of esophageal stricture, narrowing of the esophageal. Most common side effect is headache. Pyrolosic uh, is, um, is at, it's increased the risk for C. diff due to absence of GI normal flora. Long-term use of high dose of PPI may increase the risk for fractures, hips, wrists, and spine because it inhibits the calcium uptake, osteoporosis. Next, we have antacid. Antacid is aluminum hydroxide. So antacid neutralizes hydrochloride acid. Neutralize hydrochloride acid, okay? It's neutralize the acid, quick but short relief. Taken one to three hours after meals and at that time. Usually, if antacid is prescribed, we do not give it with any other medication because it can reduce the metabolism of that medication. I mean, it reduces the effectiveness of the medication that is given with. So that's why if there's a medication, 
uh, is needed to be given, we always give and test it two hours before or two hours after. We do not give it at the same time. Cytoprotective, sucrophate. Sucrophate protect and close the stomach and has cytoprotective properties. Commonly used by cancer patient, taken on an empty stomach without meal and taken 30 minutes before meal and or taken 30 minutes before meal. Um, cholinergic is bethanicol. Okay, so about antacid and sulcrophate. So if these two medications are given to you guys and you guys have to give it to patient, which one do you give first? Obviously, you're going to give sulcrophate before meal, right? And you give antacid after meal. Why? Because antacid neutralize the acid. If you guys give it before meal, there's no food in the stomach that, and the reason why the stomach secrete acid is to digest food. And if there's no food in the stomach, there'll be no acid. So what, uh, what is it it's going to neutralize? There's nothing for neutralize. So that's why we give antacid after meal so that we have acid to neutralize. And we give sulcrophate before meal is to coat the lining before we eat. Um, cholinergic is bethanicol, increases lower esophageal sphincter pressure, increases gastric emptying and how body get rid of food. Diarrhea is a side effect. And um, prokinetic drugs, methoclopramide, reclin, promote gastric emptying, reduce risk of gastric acid reflux. Diarrhea may cause hallucination. It is a GI stimulant and anti-emetic because it is a GI stimulant. It's, um, it is contraindicated with GI obstruction, hemorrhage, or perforation used in the treatment of vomiting after surgery. All right. So, yeah. All right, guys. I hope this is helpful. And I hope you guys will uh, do great on the med quiz tomorrow. Um, all right, I'll see you guys. I'll do, I, prob I don't know if I'm gonna do a recording of the GI chapter, I'll think about it, but that's it for me tonight. And um, I'll see you guys later.